this up in my headphones, Charles. Turning it up. Hello, 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 everybody, one and all. Welcome to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles, and with me today, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend, Charles. I am ready to talk some fantasy with my friend as well, Dylan, but not just any fantasy today. Because today we are continuing our epic journey through the Wheel of Time series. We are discussing Mm. book two, The Great Hunt by Robert Jordan. Yeah, I'm really excited to get into this. This is my first read through the Wheel of Time series, as some of our listeners may already know. Mm -hmm. Charles, this is your second read through, which compared to many of the folks out there like Stephen and Jake, who are on our Eye of the World episode, still makes you uh, a little bit of a novice. (laughs) Uh, Maybe one of the accepted (laughs) is fair, right? You're not... (laughs) Very well said, Dylan. I definitely feel like an accepted versus a a fantology those guys are definitely full-blown i said i for sure right but um you know we don't have them today i do have my companion book uh within <laughs> arm's reach so i'm feeling okay <laughs> you know i'd much i would much rather have you know uh jake and steven from fantology but you know what um we just gotta do this ourselves you know we we we're ready we read the books we have a lot to talk about (laughs) and you know what let's let's start with the prologue right well before we get into it i want to make sure that i let any Mm, listeners know that if they haven't yet read the great hunt that during these buddy read episodes we do get into spoilers through the book that we have read yep. we will of course not spoil beyond the great hunt because i would spoil it for me too <laughs> uh, and no one wants that um but we will have spoilers through the second book of the wheel of time series here so if you haven't yet read it and you don't want to get anything spoiled then Now's a great time to set off on the epic journey to catching up to where we're at. Um, But you might want to turn this down in your headphones for now and and maybe come back Right, spoiler warnings for The Eye of the World and The Great Hunt. But no other book in The Wheel of Time, just those two. So let's get into it. Let's get into this prologue. Um, We have a mysterious POV character whose identity remains a secret. And he's attending this um, this little gathering of dark friends, right, Dylan? Right, yeah. My first reaction was, why are we at a dark friend cocktail party, <laughs> Charles? <laughs> right. I was kind of amused by this idea. It's like, I don't know, Bialzaman just kind of getting the gang together. <laughs> and it was like, if I remember correctly, our mysterious POV character was like, uh, ooh, like, is, is Bialzaman himself going to be able to make it to this one? And <laughs> to this was, little uh, shindig, the, the who's yeah. who of Dark Friends? Yeah, it, it was, was a who's a, who. It was a bit of a masquerade, right? Because they don't know the identities of each other, and they're, you know, trying to, <laughs> you know, puzzle it out. Um, he does recognize a few of them as Aes Sedai, which is quite alarming. Um, right. about the Black Aja, and... Um, yeah, you know, I got some Voldemort vibes from this scene. Uh, Voldemort would do this sometimes. He would gather all of his buddies around, and they would all be wearing masks, trying to protect their identity. And he'd just be like scaring all of them. <laughs> and you got, I get, get, I get that vibe here. Like, I, it was kind of interesting where you're at the POV of just one of the guests at the, the Dark Friend cocktail masquerade party. And he's watching as Bialzaman speaks in their minds individually, and they are not enjoying it. And uh, it's an interesting setup, interesting setting. You know, Robert Jordan's creativity knows no bounds here. So um, that was our cocktail party. And it kicks off this mystery of who is this mysterious POV character. The second time we've got a prologue with a mysterious, with a mysterious character 
in the in the POV slot. So, well, not it wasn't a POV slot in the first one. It was the mysterious villain in that one, and this one is the mysterious POV character. So, uh, we know, interestingly enough, that that is turned out to be Ingtar, but we can get uh, into that as we Charles, go. Charles, I think Ingtar was one of the other guests. If I'm oh, was he correct here? Yeah, there's a a. St- Shinar and oh, soldier wearing a sky blue yes, coat. Yes, yes, because the POV character is wearing all white, right? So we suspect right. that he and might it's be one. Boars. Of... Yeah, yeah. It's like a, the man who called who himself, calls himself Boars. Boars, Boars but it, that's yes. how we just don't get his yeah. identity spoiled. So there are some characters that wear all white that we might suspect, but that's true. We don't. I don't think his identity is revealed. Right. Right. And. That's a good distinction. Yes, feel free to tweet at us at the FDF <laughs> Podcast One if you're uh, one of these God, folks and like uh, those on <laughs> Twitter of Time who know a lot more than we do. Uh, we're just doing our best over here, trying to puzzle through this awesomely complicated series. Yes, yes, lot to digest here. Lots of opportunities to get things wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure we will, especially me, back. when we get to the theorizing. <laughs> Dylan theorizes on his first time read portion. Yeah, Dylan thinks he's figured episode. out where the 14 book series is going to go from book two. <laughs> well, I did. Yeah, if you haven't heard our "I Have the World" episode, I did try to make a claim as to what the entire I have the, or sorry, the entire Wheel of Time series is going to be about. So you can find that out there. But I have some, I have some more specific theorizing to do in this episode, but we will get there in due time, Charles. All in due time. But in the meantime, we are chilling at Fall Dara. I mean, we were here for a good, like, (laughs) 25% of this book. And, uh, yeah, boy, did we stick around. What were your thoughts, Dylan, on this whole a uh, fall dara scenario i was a little bit confused at first because mm-hmm. i remembered that at the end of the eye of the world it was like Rand decided to leave yeah and then it's like it's been a month <laughs> and Rand has not left I-, I guess we needed Rand to learn how to fight with a sword mm-hmm. you know lan had to teach him if if Rand was going to believably be able to do some of the stuff he does later in the book and then we also i mean here's what i'll say charles i too i'm getting the sense from you charles that you would have preferred getting out of Feldara earlier than 25 percent in is that is yeah that 20 to 25 percent is just too long and especially when it's Rand being like i want to leave but i can't because mm-hmm. I don't want to. It's like, what? (laughs) You know, it's that circular thing. Like, yes, we're all worried about Matt's condition. You know, he has this psychic attachment to this parasitic dagger. And that's kind of, I I think, why Rand is sticking around for as long as he is. He's like, oh, I got to make sure uh, Matt's okay. And everyone's like, dude, if you're going to leave, you should leave. Like, and now he's like, I'm not going to let any. I said I control me. But yet he lets more and more into his life and it's like hey heads up the omerlin seat herself is coming like this is your last chance before she's here and he's like oh i should leave but but matt (laughs) it's like dude what do you think you're gonna do in 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 faldara so uh, you know it, it was a long time coming but um we did get to meet a few characters along the way. I do say, speaking of the Amelin seat, I do like her quite a bit. I like that she had all these like sea idioms <laughs> like as part of her character. It's like, yeah, she grew up with all these fishermen on boats and stuff, so she's like, Oh, like a gutted fish. <laughs> it's like, okay. Like very interesting kind of character development. A little quirk yeah. for the Amelin seat. Yeah. And I will say something I did enjoy about the Thaldara time is I like when our main characters are all kind of together and able to interact with each other. Yep. And that's something that I imagine will wax and wane as we move through the series, how much the characters are all together. Probably, I really don't know where it's at, that's heading, but I, you know, I've, I like Egwene a lot and I'm more I'm interested in the Gwen and Rand interactions and relationship. I f- 
feel like we got to see a little bit more of that here and then yes. the rest of the book we basically don't get to <laughs> see that again like we we i don't i think once they leave faldar although they are near each other at points they're either catching a glimpse of the other one from afar or they one of them's unconscious or something like that so i did like we got a little bit of time with those two and I'll, i'm sure i'll get to mm. touch on on those two more so yeah just having kind of everyone all in the same place it's nice to spend some time there I, i'm with you though charles i, I think we, yeah, I mean, we did get to learn a lot about i said we got to see uh, the different ajas and kind mm-hmm. of the political internal office politics of the i said i which was quite interesting you know there's the reds and uh, which are basically like very anti men because any man that can channel is a huge issue so they've kind of committed themselves to seeing men as villains and then that kind of conflicts with like the green aja which has lots of warders and so you like there's all the back and forth and that was interesting to learn about like this is kind of the first time we're exposed to those things so that was interesting as well we get more pat on thane in the prison so there's all those things but yeah, it's a lot of Rand running around, checking up on everybody, meeting everybody, uh, until finally something happens <laughs> where, um, you know, the dark friends attack and they make off with the horn and the dagger. They steal them. And uh, the, so the great hunt begins, basically, to reclaim the horn of Valir and Matt's dagger. Yeah, that's pretty much the big exciting incident of this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah, there was that scene where basically like Rand happens upon all these dead bodies and the uh, uh, blood writing on the wall and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. That was pretty interesting. I, th- yeah, I, I thought that. It was something that probably, if you saw it in a bit of a more modern series, they would have spruced up the action a little bit around right. it. But it was an interesting scene, and, and definitely the fact that they set this tone of kind of business as usual and things are just kind of happening, whatever, for a while, then it feels like the, uh, you know stuff starts moving pretty quick all of a sudden right after that like oh wow all these people are just dead (laughs) when almost nothing was happening for a while right it's interesting that you talk about the like the the violence versus like the action and how like maybe more modern series would kind of play up the like exciting moments that would have led to this bloody outcome and one of the things that i was kind of keeping track on throughout this series and i think they like are most prominent like here at the end of faldara and at the beginning of this kind of hunt chase situation was i was paying close attention to the violence and the just like the scariness of it because when we spoke with phantology last time on our eye of the world discussion we were talking about oh what does the show need to do that's coming out on wheel of time to for modern audiences compared to the books and Jake from Phantology the TV show. Yeah, the TV show. Thank you. Um, Jake from Phantology said that the show needs to like, he's hoping that they embrace the scary moments of wheel of time. And I, and I kind of internally was like, wheel of time's not scary. Like what happens in wheel of time? And it's like, Oh yeah. Like all these people get like brutally murdered and people get eaten alive. And there's blood, and there's blood writing, on blood the writing on the walls, like torture scenes, people hanging, like really graphic stuff. The Damani, the Damani, but shtick, what kind we'll of that. made me forget, Get about it after all these years of not reading it was like you said how it was presented we always see it kind of afterwards like rand is walking in on this horrific aftermath we're not getting like the blow by blow and i kind of see like sanderson's inspiration for his violence as well because i think his books are it's like mistborn for example is violent but it's told in the same way as like this book in particular because it's like you walk in and you see all the the gore and the blood but it implies what happened here's i yeah i can think of a particular scene in mistborn the final empire that i feel like you're referencing but i won't 
uh, we won't I spoil won't say anything details in, <laughs> around that. Uh, but I do. I I get what you're saying, which is this: like, if things get extremely gruesome, Sanderson will not give you the gory details yeah. in the way that someone like let's say Joe Abercrombie would very much be willing to give you. Right. Joe Abercrombie will tell you exactly what's happening in all of its awful details that we wouldn't go into on our clean show. Right. That being said, I think that Sanderson does go toward the blow by blow acts aspect of action scenes as much as anyone in the genre, oh, yeah, he like just won't flesh out like scenes, the blood yeah. is doing this and the uh, yeah. like. He'll if it's like comes they're not to... like screaming in pain or like no. bleeding out. It's not like gore splattering everywhere. Um, but there is like oh the, the clash, the punch, wham, oh, like right, you know, like that kind of stuff is very exciting and Mistborn for sure. So that I guess is kind of the progression we've gotten towards. Like you said, like oh I wanted to see more of the blow by blow here which Sanderson does give us later on in the history of modern fantasy. But he still kind of shies away from the gore, which is totally fine. It's like we're coming off reading yeah. Abercrombie, which it, it embraced every detail of everything. So it's, it, it was just kind of like it, it seems tame, even though what's happening is super horrific in a lot of times right like all the implications of like oh these people were eaten alive in cook pots and eaten by pe you know by trollocs you know it's a very scary terrifying thing to imagine like if you actually showed that in detail it would be horrific so i i, I just thought it was super interesting how that kind of violence was, was balanced by jordan and how that's kind of gone on to affect like author's decisions in, in gore versus violence you know it's it's really interesting and mm, i was just paying close violence. i was just paying yeah. attention to that in in the great hunt yeah so there's basically two continuums we're working with here right it's like how gory do you depict the violence uh, is one continuum and then there's this other like how detailed are you in the blow by blow action of the fight and if you think of something like Lord of the Rings as <laughs> low on both. way, way back, <laughs> it's low on both. Yeah, it's more of this like above everything, like telling you a tale about a battle that had happened. Yeah. Uh, while, while then uh, Robert Jordan is like, OK, well, I'm not going to give you the uh, like this person stepped here and then this person did that. Uh, but uh, and I guess not really, but a little bit more than like middle maybe of that continuum right, right. like uh, the how much blow by blow do you get with jordan well if there's a fight scene he'll tell you what you need to know but he's not it's not this like popcorn eating yeah. action <laughs> right. sequence like a sanderson novel right. and he's also pretty low down on how gory he gets but he'll get gorier for sure than does tolkien so yeah. he's maybe like jordan is kind of in the middle of both of those continuums or or like maybe like toward the lower end of the gore continuum but right. higher now, the wheel of time has always kind of been an interesting series for me it just is was written and published in a really interesting time in the history of the development of modern fantasy so i was always looking at like oh like gore and violence are two things that i'm seeing kind of being experimented with here that have you know, affected modern writers quite a bit. And like you said, it's kind of in between Lord of the Rings and a Sanderson Abercrombie. It's an interesting transitional. Yeah. Well, work. Abercrombie would be cranked up on both of those <laughs> on both all the way to the top. Yeah. yeah. For sure, for sure. So, um, yeah, it was just something that really stuck out to me in these early, early moments because Put on Thane does some really ruthless, like, yeah. horrible things to innocent people and even to his own like to fades he like was doing horrible stuff to them like crucifying them basically which was a bizarre sight to think about um so i was just really interested in that um anything else about kind of these early great hunt moments we want to touch base on here no but you brought up thane and i just wanted to comment on something about Thane, mm -hmm. which was, you remember, like, he's got that moment where he's giving away the horn? Yes. This is way later, but. Way yeah. later, yeah. 
<laughs> he's and he's like got this internal monologue, and he keeps thinking of himself as a worm. He's like, yes, like a worm burrowing in. <laughs> Do you no? Are you not? I, he thinks it like multiple times. I got this not remember. stick out to you. <laughs> no, I, I, I was just. I think Jordan was just trying to pull on imagery of dark fiend, dark friend, dark fiend kind of stuff like worms and maggots and stuff. But it's like in the end, he just basically made his character call himself a worm. <laughs> right. Well, he does it a bunch of times, and I, I guess that's something that sticks out to me as kind of where Jordan fits in a little bit more in this talk about like fantasy writing and stuff like that is Jordan was still a little bit more of this like Tolkien style thinking of this like there are these evil people who basically like are so evil they don't even really think they're the heroes of their own stories like in Thane's head he's like I'm like a worm like what can I say and (laughs) I feel like that's another step that Sanderson was like okay yeah like I like having these people who are pretty much just the bad guys sometimes and I'm all right with character like that but if I'm gonna give you what they think of themselves they're probably not gonna think they are like a disgusting worm of a character they will probably think they're uh, like doing something a little bit better yeah there's a lot of characters and types of characters that you can see what jordan was drawing influence from from lord of the rings you know in so many ways like yeah trollocs are orcs and uh fades are wraiths and you know all these other things Uh, moraine is gandalf but um if I had to pick something for Thane, I would say Gollum, kind of. Like, he was... Yeah, he reminds me of Gollum. He, he's he got that Gollum but... vibes in certain ways, where he's, like, gone to... He was part of the Shadow and escaped, and, it, like, you don't... Like, he's kind of the wild card, but that's kind of where the similarities end. But, you know, Gollum is another one who's also kind of self-deprecating in a little bit of ways, because he has right. that, like, edge to him. Thane yeah, is just the I next guess. level. Thane is like a bad yeah. dude. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I'm like, I feel like for me, it's hard when you put me in the perspective of a character that literally is like thinking of themselves as a worm. I'm like, <laughs> people don't think of them. People think they're doing something good usually and they're just mistaken. I mean, that's why someone likes, like Abercrombie appeals so much to me right. is this idea that Abercrombie, no matter whose perspective he's putting you in, no matter how terrible a person they may or may not be, he's going to try to justify, like they're going to try to rationalize or justify it themselves. So I think it's like, it makes a lot of sense for what Jordan's doing because he is kind of inspired by this more like good versus evil idea of thinking, but it's definitely different from how a lot of these modern fantasy authors are thinking about the things now. Very well said, sir. Um, where we are in the story, let's see. So we are beginning the hunt. We're chasing Pat on Thane. And something very interesting happens, Dylan, where they all oh. go to sleep. And this random crew uh, consisting of Rand, uh, the Sniffer, Hurin, and your best buddy, Loyal wake up and find themselves separated from the rest of the Shinaran party. They were transported uh, to an alternate world. And they're like, what happened? (laughs) Yeah. Well, they basically, they went to sleep near the portal stone, right? Right. Was the the thing that happened. Mm -hmm. So then they end up in this alternate world thing. And it's, yeah, I mean, this was an interesting moment. It definitely made me more intrigued into the story where right. I was like, oh, wow, they're dealing with like teleporting to different worlds and stuff like that. That's not something we ever dealt with in the Lord of the Rings. Right. Or anything like that. It's like, okay, we're doing something a little bit different here. And I was, I was having fun with that. I think I, I also liked that they get to this character, Celine. A lot yeah. my, my theorizing is based around Celine. Uh, yes, it, Celine just kind of enters the stage, you know, just she just kind of walks into the story and is like, hello, everyone, right. I'm Celine, let's go. <laughs> so it's like, yep. yeah, that in itself is, a, is was interesting to me, you know, like this whole segment is like, kind of felt, it was interesting, but it was also kind of abrupt in the way it was 
it the way like the events unfold it's like okay we woke up and we're in another world it's like what <laughs> you just hit me with that rj right out of the <laughs> you can't but i like it win with you charles I liked it's it. either it's too long a, it's or not it's too abrupt it's like i think the wheel of time is at its best when you know like when there's all these things happening and robert jordan pushes his creativity you know mm. like the things that get us further from lord of the rings are his best work in my opinion yeah. and when he actually starts doing stuff he starts to experiment you know it's not until things start happening that we start to see new and interesting things so i'm totally in support of these scenes it's just kind of funny that it's like oh we're not in lord of the rings mode anymore we're in like bizarro world mode now it's like i'm ready let's let's do it so and then and then with and it's Celine. something <laughs> yeah i think it's something that rj does extremely well is he, this whole thing is very deliberately paralleling lord of the rings in a lot of ways right, right? he basically has said in in many ways it is a love letter to tolkien's work and i think that what he's doing here is he grounds us so well <laughs> in this almost middle earth feeling world with these not a lot happening whatever status quo that when he does just abruptly take us into this whole different world it hits us even harder and it's even more interesting because it's couched in this like wait what you can do this and that's how the characters are feeling charles that's how rand is feeling when he goes through this it's like what just happened how am i in another world and we feel that too as readers and i think that's when the reading experience is is so good is when you're par you're having the same kind of experience as the characters mm, and mm. i think we really do mirror rand and my good buddy loyal's uh experience here very well and, and celine just kind of happens <laughs> upon them too yeah. and they're like what is going on with this person <laughs> yeah like this, this this story is really diverting and i will say this is maybe one of the few times i actually am ex feeling like mirroring the experiences of rand <laughs> because we'll talk <laughs> about rand a little bit more later sure. very shortly but it's like man rand goes through a lot that i and I, I'm not on the same page, but that this certainly these moments with the with the portal stone, we are definitely both taken by surprise here. And Celine, during the scene, you know, I got a lot of like Lady Macbeth vibes from Celine. It's like, oh, you should be the one with the horn, you know, like he who has the horn is great power, and you should be the one that has it. You know, you have to get the horn. Where it's like, okay, and Rand's thinking like, oh wow, like she's pretty. <laughs> it's like. Okay, you have to. He is a teenager, yeah, yeah, so right. get it together. <laughs> yeah, but Rand, you gotta start thinking here. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's fair, right? If I'm gonna be always pushing that they're teenagers yeah. bit when it comes to Quoth and Dana, I, I have to give Rand the benefit of the doubt a little bit too. So, okay, Rand, we get you're not picking up by anything. I mean, Celine, to me, from the beginning out like this she's bad news. Yeah. she is bad bad news. right she, <laughs> she did, like robert jordan when he writes you know he's suspicious it's a suspicious character and you know i don't want to spoil what happens with celine but in these moments certainly if you're not suspicious of celine like i don't know what you're thinking <laughs> so right well here's something that i was picking up on is only a couple chapters before we meet celine we have Egwene, wonderful Egwene, wonderful having these dreams about uh, Rand, mm -hmm. and I mean, who doesn't dream about Rand? <laughs> I know right? he's but so dreamy I, I do and get tall. The, yes, right. <laughs> yeah, ever, everyone wants. Him. <laughs> Everyone's dreaming about yeah. Rand. So we'll. But Egwene's dreams do feel a little bit special here, right. Charles. That maybe there's something a little bit deeper going on. Well, it's mentioned in, in this book dreams. that Egwene might have these prophetic dreams. Mm -hmm. She might be the super yes. rare version of Aes Sedai that can have some sort of prophecy in her dreams, but it needs to be tested. We need to find out still, but it was put out there in the ether that she might be able to do these things. So it is out there in the ether. So I'm expecting more to come in. And because of that, we have to take Egwene's dreams and what's coming up very seriously. Mm -hmm. 
and seems like there's like a man with a mask, which seems like it's probably Bialzaman. Yeah. But more interestingly, she sees Rand uh, as kind of this, I think he's sleeping, like kind of helpless. And there's a woman standing over him that clearly wishes him harm, mm. like is dangerous for Rand. Mm. And I think that that, you know, comes only a couple chapters before we meet Celine. And Egwene's like, oh, who could this be? And of course, Egwene has no reason to think she doesn't know who Celine right. is, but she's getting this sense. And then it's like, who's the next woman that Standing next Rand to comes Rand. into yeah. contact with? <laughs> And who's whispering, like, go for the glory, Rand. <laughs> Take the horn for yourself. It's like, okay, this person is just like, Just bad, show bad me the horn. So we'll... I want to see it. It's like, okay. Right. That's... So you want my theory, yeah, Charles? let's hear it. Okay. So I feel like this is only one part, one part of my many theories, but... There's apparently a character who is daughter of the night, mm. and Lanfear is the mm-hmm. name, and she was Luz Theron's lover mm-hmm. before Iliana. 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 <laughs> Dude, we gotta grab we do that. Have to grab that. Iliana. <laughs> Iliana. <laughs> so, before Iliana, uh, there was Lanfear. And then Lanfear became Forsaken, if I'm tracking so all this correctly. So far, you're correct, yes. <laughs> right. Okay, so I think all that's just facts. The theory for me is that Selene is Lanfear. Interesting. That's my theory. Well, you've heard it here, and... folks. It's on record. This is Dylan's theory. Yes. You're saying that Selene is Lanfear. That's the theory. Right. Interesting. I'm still, yeah, I'm still working out if it's some sort of the wheel weaves bit where it's like playing out in the same way as it did. (laughs) Yes. Like, I don't know if it is like Celine is like a reincarnation sort of shtick of Lanfear or like actually Lanfear herself, but I, mm, I do think mm, that's what's happening. And there is this moment where Celine is like getting, she's getting asked what her name is. And she, uh, I mean, it's not clear that she did this, but it feels like she like made one of the servers drop a lantern or something like that. Like they're mm-hmm. carrying a lantern right. or something and made them drop it. So it's like, and then she's always disappearing, all this kind yeah, of stuff. So I do think, uh, yeah, we'll see. I mean, you're you're doing a good poker face over there, Charles. So I I never know if I'm just making a total fool of myself <laughs> when I'm doing Only this. Only time will tell. But uh, yes, uh, <laughs> time will tell. But I have other theories about who, kind of the equivalent this round of the wheel turning is for like which character is the equivalent of which past character obviously Luz Theron is Rand like I don't think saying Rand is like (laughs) the next Luz Theron is a theory I think that's essentially confirmed I mean how many times do we have to hear if you ask Rand he says no he's not Rand's denying it (laughs) he's a sheep herder I'm a sheep herder he's just a sheep herder (laughs) (laughs) that's another sound bite (laughs) yeah that's true yeah that would be a good one I'm a sheep herder from the two livers I'm done with (laughs) Aes Sedai dude that's uh he says next as he episode. follows an I said I around through a way gate and I said dude, I just so met. much <laughs> contempt for Rand well you know it's just kind of I feel like we're so far past this point of like the fantasy protagonist <laughs> it's hard to kind of go back and like read Rand who is the classic like fantasy protagonist of like right oh like I'm not acknowledging the fact that I'm six foot seven and super handsome and really good at everything. Like I'm not the dragon reborn. I'm a shepherd from the true rivers. It's like, dude, <laughs> look at yourself in a mirror. You're obviously not. <laughs> dude, you yeah, can channel I feel like you. you're not a shepherd. 
it's tough. Yeah. I mean, it makes a lot of sense in the context. I think this is uh, what this is where RJ was when he was writing this. And this is a kind of protagonist that made sense at that time. But it is very strange to go back from reading like Rin from the Poppy War trilogy, (laughs) which is like a ridiculously proactive, if nothing else, right? right? Character, very intriguing and complex in a lot of ways. And uh, then, you know, Rand has some complexity to him for sure with the, the fact that he's got this kind of internal struggle while externally everyone views him as amazing and all this kind of stuff. But He's, yeah, right. he can be a tough protagonist when it comes to comparing him to some of these newer characters we're reading that do some different things we've never seen Right, before. without spoiling anything from First Law, I will say there's, like, Jazal as a character seems kind of like a response to a character like Rand, you know, or it's like mm. this, this just like, this idea of the of this, like, you know, handsome proactive like this handsome like character is like oh i'm not i'm not who i'm not this person yeah and then just being like all these other forces dragging them along i feel like just all just kind of like the response to like what a character like rand would really be like you know so it's uh maybe in some i mean i want i want to spend time talking about first no, no. there might be a lot of listeners who yet no i would guess there are a lot of listeners who haven't read first law so i don't want to spend too much time getting into it but I'm not sure I entirely agree. I see what you're getting at, though, with the not proactive. Neither are proactive. Both are kind of like... And then the different ways of how, you know, Rand is like, I'm not going to be controlled by I said I. You know, it's like this idea of, like, how a character is, like, put through the plot. You know, how the, how right. the plot progresses is is interesting. Um, I see but what yeah, you're getting you, at, we can We yeah. can move past it. What I do, while we're on the topic of Rand, the only other thing I wanted to talk about, and that might help us seg into the into the um, the world of the Aes Sedai here, is just that how everybody loves Rand. It's like, that's another thing about his character. It's like, you have you have Min, you have Elaine, you have Egwene, and they're like, well, if you don't marry him, I will. And if I don't marry him, you will. None of us can marry him. Tee-hee-hee. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, come on. Yeah. Everyone wants to marry Rand right now. Yeah. Like, me I hear you, barely Charles. met the guy. I... <laughs> like... Well, yeah. That I'll say I'm <laughs> I said on, on Twitter not too far back that I'm more interested in everyone else's perceptions of Rand than I am in yeah, Rand. That's fair. Uh, well said. <laughs> Right. And I think I, I'm like very intrigued by the fact that everyone reacts to Rand this way. I, I'm not sure. I guess like when I try to step back and I think about it, it's like, OK, Rand has all those things you were naming going for him where he's like uh, this tall, handsome, amazing and everything guy. So I get why some of the appeal might be there. He's already doing all these heroic things and everyone keeps telling him that he like the whole world and its fate kind of circles around him so i do get why there would be some appeal to a person like yeah, and that right? and, and if we didn't get to see around <laughs> right and if we didn't get to see Rand's internal monologue we would probably see him in the same kind of way because i know you're making all those right. Like those jokes, but they're very accurate about this. Like uh, how he's almost like whiny a lot of the times in his internal monologue. It feels like right. to us. But if you were someone out in the real world and just saw the things that this guy was doing, like being amazing at everything and being ridiculously <laughs> uh, like good looking, he's got it's a really like fancy fate is going to turn around he's really him. Well like, dressed, he's holding right. himself well. Yeah, he looks like a lord. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, maybe people would react to him in this kind of way. I will say, like, we, it's a kind of thing that looking back at a book that was published, you know, nearly three decades ago, that it's like, okay, yeah, we don't need every female character to be in love with our protagonist. <laughs> that does feel dated. Um, I'm sure I'm far from the first person to say that, but that that is how it 
strikes right. me. I, I think the the thing that makes it interesting is the idea of being Taviran and which is what Matt, Perrin, and Rand all are, which is like the whole universe of Wheel of Time is built around the patterns and the wheel of time and how it spins and all these patterns are like it's a kind of a combination of destiny and free will, how they kind of battle each other quite a bit. And the Taviran just kind of smash it all and, and rework it and and kind of affect destiny in that way. So the fact that he might do something bizarro, like have these three women kind of, you know, somehow pulled into his life just from like being that's from true. meeting him, it is interesting. But it does like to a modern reader comes off like, oh wow, all the women characters love Rand. It's like get over yourself but it is interesting if you take a step back and think about like how this world is built and who rand is like get outside of his head get outside of the lack of progressiveness about it i guess you could say and um think about it from this perspective of like oh here's rand like just shattering all of these threads and patterns and things and pulling people in towards him yeah. you know it's, it's it's an interesting idea that only gets further explored in the series but it's it certainly got min elaine and Egwene kind of uh trapped in it in some way um and their story yeah Charles, go ahead. I was... yeah no i you're just making such good points i sure, want to comment sure, sure. on them before you make more let's good talk points about my good points. so <laughs> let's talk about your good point well one of our first time tips that we got from uh, one of the wonderful folks over on hashtag twitter of time was that it's okay for us to look back on it with our more modern perspectives Mm -hmm. and to keep in mind that this was written at the time that was was great advice so i think this is one of those moments and i think that was great advice uh and i'm sure we we credit the wonderful person for giving it on uh our episode (laughs) where we talked about the first time tip so definitely check that out there were a couple people that mentioned that but yeah that was a great point so yeah awesome point i think this is one of those moments and i think when we take ourselves like you were saying out of this like okay well I'd prefer from a modern perspective that all three of these main like teenage girl characters weren't all in love with our protagonist just immediately. I do like you bringing the insight around like they are kind of bound to him (laughs) through destiny in some way. And that like, that's part of what's at play. Like there's just, generations and generations and generations of the wheel turning in this way where things have played out a particular way with the like it's hard to say like the the equivalent figures for each time i guess is the way to speak of them and i'll say yeah well i'm gonna launch another theory at you okay let's hear it elaine is (laughs) ilian Okay, interesting. Like the Ilya, like Ilya. that's the uh, Ili- Sorry, did I say Ilya- Iliana? Uh, yeah, but it's Ilyana, yes, right? I think so. Ilyana, Elaine is Ilyana. I mean, there's so this I got clued into when there was like the heroes of the horn come and Otarin. It was like there's this guy Otarin. But like you might know him as Oscar, <laughs> and <laughs> that definitely is paraphrasing. But it was like they have these kind of different names throughout the ages, right. and I was like, "Well, all the names they listed during that point were like kind of close." So I was like, "Okay, they well, I'm close. gonna start yeah. keeping an eye out for what names are close to what names." And you mentioned Charles how you were bothered by the fact that Egwene and Elaine have similar mm-hmm. names and I think that's not by accident now that I'm seeing mm-hmm. this so we they want us to RJ I think wants us to think that Egwene's in the picture but we've also been told Charles by Min that uh, there's a a line that's like she's not for you nor for nor you for her at least not in the way you both want that's Min to Rand um, yeah yeah so I think that all this is adding up to me that Elaine is probably the 
Ilian a equivalent for this round of the wheel turning. Mm -hmm. Egwene, I do not think is, and I think that Rand and Elaine will end up together. But, Charles, as Min also notes in what seems like a joke, that Elaine will have to share her husband with two other women uh, despite being queen. So mm -hmm. I think that the other two women are Min and Egwene are kind of tied into this whole way that the wheel turns. So that those are the two women that will be kind of in the mix. I don't think it's going to be like they're all married or anything like that, but I do think that that's what all that is getting at. So that's, but that's, that's the whole time. point of this, this book. It's like, what is the solution? They all like them. So it's like, well, now what? <laughs> you know, like maybe some of us yeah. will get ruled out. Maybe not. Like I said, I don't do this or do this or I'm a queen or whatever. Like, that's the um, that's the challenge here. And no, it's a, it's a very interesting. And that's like when I first read it, I had that same ish. Like you're like, man, like <laughs> all these characters like him. So what's the end game here? Like you know, it's uh, and it goes back to what I think a lot of people were telling us from Twitter of time and all that is like everything's a prophecy. Everything's like a callback right. and. You know, even like you said, where it's like even Egwene's dreams, like, oh, you might have prophetic dreams. It's like everything Robert Jordan you writes prophetic sounds dreams. prophetic. So and it, uh, it pretty much is. And uh, you just have to go along for the ride. I, you know, I think if you've got a lot of theories, we might have to record another episode just of Dylan's theories at at this point. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> keep the okay. keep the books we'll moving. <laughs> keep I've been trying, yeah, moving. I've been trying to drop them. As but it is interesting. Relevant, I do like hearing them. You yeah, like it, 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 right? I'm I'm doing my best. I feel like that's most of the people I've interacted with on social media who find out I'm reading it for the first time. A lot of them are like, "Oh, like let me know your theories." Yeah, as and we, I appreciate that you're drawn from it. the source material. We might have to, you know, you're putting all this work into. We might have to compartmentalize these into other episodes you know like dylan's theories yeah, yeah, after yeah. reading uh, the great hunt three you know? books and we can yeah talk okay. about it talk about them more give them a give yeah. them time i think that would be interesting and yeah people are asking about it you know you gotta deliver um so cool all right yeah well, okay we'll revisit. I'll, I'll refrain from too much theorizing for the rest of this episode okay, and okay. then we'll try to we can look out we'll try those. to give it to you all in one jam-packed <laughs> Dylan theorizing episode. Hopefully, I didn't use up too many, but I'm sure I'll have more after the Great Hunt. Yeah, well, so. maybe well, after yeah. we read the Dragon Reborn, we can do it. You know, or yeah. sorry, after right, Dragon right, Reborn, right. I said after the Great um, Hunt. So yes. one thing I really want to make sure we talk about because it's maybe my favorite scene in this Ooh. whole book is the test of the accepted that Nynaeve uh, goes through. Yeah, and I think we're pretty much at that point in the story. We get to see the White Tower and how that works with the novice and the accepted and the Aes Sedai and the dorms and like all the different Aes Sedai, you know, it's very interesting. And I, you know, I've always thought the Aes Sedai and the magic system of the Aes Sedai and Sayadar and Sayadin is, was, is one of the best parts of the wheel of time. So I really liked these moments. Um, but for me, the most interesting thing was when they were basically like naive, you're super, talented but you know you grew up on this through the school of hard knocks you know you got all these you know you have these weird habits with your channeling it's strong enough to make you an accepted but it's going to kind of hold you back kind of like this gohan syndrome where it's like you have so much potential but you have to get really angry in order to access it but when you do look out <laughs> you know so that's kind of an interesting thing that happens with naive but it's the test that i wanted to talk about because she goes through all of the trials um you know each trial that she goes through is this different like what if scenario yeah it's kind of tempting her to not commit to being part of the I said I and that to me was so interesting like she has that moment where she's like married to Lan and they have kids yes and it's like oh you're the love of my life naive and we have a happy family and she has to walk away from that 
And there's right. also the moment where she's back in the two rivers and there's all of these, um, all the villagers need her and they're like begging her for help and that they're being abused without her and they need her and she has to walk away from them too. And it's this interesting theme of like the price of success, you know, and mm. kind of like if you want to be the best, that's your, your relationships are going to be sacrificed kind of. And right. Like, you can't have like a loving committed relationship and kids and, 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 you know, be an eye to die. And that to me was the most interesting part of, of this whole book. I don't know what your takes on that. We're doing. I would say to me, this was the second most interesting <laughs> part of the whole Fair. book. And <laughs> I'll, I'll say that was second to all those moments with the possible futures that rand could have had or maybe not possible futures but possible timelines and i and i think that what we're touching on here is this like what makes rj's writing interesting so interesting and so special Mm -hmm. even like i've not i've not seen a lot of this kind of stuff these almost like simulation (laughs) like simulation of potential lives and how do people it's kind of sci-fi but very very embedded in yeah yeah it's really cool right yeah and i love how rj explores those things in this novel and i think that how he does it through nynaeve's potential both like horrible (laughs) things that could happen like the whole village goes to waste because you left them behind and having to confront that and like that was one of her biggest fears but it's also interesting to think of the fear of like it's almost a FOMO (laughs) right like the fear of missing out on a just satisfied life with someone that you really care about very well said and I appreciated that fear was like she's going in and she's worried about spiders and it's like that <laughs> yeah that's pretty relatable i think for a lot of us it's my like my biggest oh, no, fear you mean show spiders? Me my greatest fears <laughs> it's like spiders maybe snakes like uh... <laughs> but instead we get one of the fears is just having to leave behind this potentially happy life full of fulfilling that's relationships. That's so well said. And that's what's really interesting about Nynaeve because she hates Moraine and she hates I said I. But then when it comes time to take the test, which is basically testing her commitment to becoming an I said I, right? It's like, oh, do you really want to be an I said I when you could have a loving relationship with Lan and have like a family and children and all these things? And she's basically saying, no, I choose to pursue being an I said I and it's like oh would you leave your village to like you you can't save your village if you leave and she accepts that by passing that challenge as well really tough things things you're kind of, I keep going back to Nynaeve like she's she's accepting that she has this power and this potential yet she doesn't like anything about the people involved in it you know it's a really interesting line but she commits to it all in and these tests Mm -hmm. like this idea of having these like alternate universe scenario moments through the challenge of the accepted was like super impactful to me it's like okay Nynaeve is all in as much as she likes to talk smack about Moraine she's she's committing herself to this world and it shows you how committed the Aes Sedai are to the pursuit of like the white tower yeah it's such an interesting point you make there charles about Nynaeve. i i'm curious to see more of what's underlying Nynaeve's motivation mm-hmm. here i think that Nynaeve is a character I, I find Nynaeve one of the most interesting characters i know she's someone who annoys a lot of people because i think her haughtiness I, I understand why that is annoying and frustrating. I, I, I've i said this kind of bit on Twitter too before, but so I hope I'm not repeating myself for anyone who's looking around. But I'll say that she, I, I, I think she's a character that has a lot of depth because there's this exterior presence she has to put up of having to have it all together 
together and be an authority figure because she's someone who rose to this wisdom position of authority at such a young Mm -hmm. age that she's she basically has to do that or she gets treated like a little kid and people don't respect her authority so she's had to learn how to put up this gruff exterior but beneath it you can tell that she just cares so much about the people around her especially the people from the village that's why that was the one of the big fears was that the village would be so negatively affected by her leaving and i think she's not super in touch with her own motivations because of this like she's kind of had to lie to herself so she's telling herself charles that she's doing it to get vengeance on moraine but i think underlying that is she's pursuing this to have the kind of power to protect the people that she cares about that's true and And what i also love about um nynaeve is yes she's like walking away from lan and from her village in these tests but she knows she's in a test and it speaks to nynaeve's power that she's like i'll play along with these games i'll walk away from lan and the village in these scenarios but I'm coming back. You know, you kind of get that vibe from Nynaeve where she's like, she's part of her walking away from them was her stubbornness of like, I'm going to pass these tests because they don't think I can do it or whatever, or I want to show them what I can do and I'm going to get through it. So she does recognize she's taking a test, which, you know, kind of muddies the results, but she does commit. And I think it's this really interesting blend of one, she's obviously bought into pursuing Um, growing her power as someone who can channel and two i do think she's also kind of proving it to these you know more traditionally schooled i said i that she can roll with the best of them so it's always like been an interesting duality to Nynaeve's character (laughs) right charles yeah that's all well said i think there's a lot of there's a lot of depth to get into with her and that's another yeah. thing we could probably spend uh, far far too much time getting into. But these sequences are, yeah, they're part of what makes RJ's writing stick oh, out yeah. still. These are even some of the shining later. moments for sure. And they parallel your favorite scene. Speaking of um, alternate scenarios, you want to kind of introduce us to your favorite scene in The Great Hunt? <laughs> Yeah. So my favorite scene, it might surprise no one that it's when they're leaving the the place with all the Ogier. The Waygate and the right. Steading. And... Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm saying it's when they're leaving Loyal and all. Well, Loyal's coming with them, but Loyal's whole clan. Right. Um, so I think that it's it's the... Are you sure it's not when they're using the portal stone? Uh, it's it's the There's way when they like remove the leaf off the thing and walk through it, and doesn't that trigger all those right. all those um, alternate scenarios at that point? Yeah, that's the way. Gate well, yeah, they either remove the leaf. Right, right. Either way, I'll say that it's all those future scenarios that play out for. Rand as ways his life could have gone and it has all these moments like a bunch of them go the way of him ending up marrying Egwene in a bunch of ways and I'm very eh. these like childhood friend uh, relationship dynamics or they they amp together or they don't because there's some sort of thing that's making it really hard for them to end up together that's I don't know that just pulls at my heartstrings Mm -hmm. Always, Charles, and I think that the Egwene and Rand relationship totally hits me in the in the feels, in part because of that dynamic. I mean, uh, it's and it's really interesting. It goes through all these different scenarios, and most of them, it's like he ends up with Egwene, but there's always a sense that like something's missing, right? And it's it's just very interesting to see all of these potential timelines that we could have gotten. And no matter what Rand chooses, if it's not 
pretty much exact one that I imagine we're following in the main chronology of the series. There's like this sense that things are not going the way that they should be. And it, and it even comes up later on where Rand's like getting this sense of how things should be. And I like this toying around with destiny. And it also just hits me in the feels to have these moments where it's like Rand lives out a full life with Egwene. And she kind of like helps him through the facts that he, to, through the times in which he's uh, struggling with uh, like losing his, uh, his mind really. Right. And then, uh, like, she passes, and he goes on to uh, himself fight against, like, all the bad things that are happening in the world because Rand never got to be the dragon reborn, right. and then he dies too, and it just ends over and over again with this, like, uh, what was it? It was like, I win again, lose yeah. Theron, or I have won again, lose yeah. Theron. And I was listening to the audiobook of that, and that was that's an earworm for me, Charles. Was this like I have won again, Louis Theron? Yeah. And I don't know. I, I I think that it's such a it's such a a touching moment in a lot of ways, and and an interesting moment that's unlike the other things that we've read. It's uh, so true, and this is again RJ's creativity shining through here. Like, I think we take for granted sometimes when Moraine says for the millionth time, the wheel wheels as the wheel will, you know, like that kind of stuff. Like, oh, the pattern, it's all in the pattern. It's like this idea of destiny versus like, you know, what you can choose for yourself and free will and all of that. And one of the ways that that is explored in these scenes where you get these multiple timelines, scenarios over and over, this is the wheel turning these are the different patterns and the, the different threads and you get to see all the different ways in which these stories play out and the one constant is that there is this relationship between um Egwene and ran and there's you know some cases in which you know Egwene dies young or that they get to grow old together you know like all these like really interesting things and you get to see like how that relationship plays out and it's touching to see that the constant is that they do both really care for each other and they're both um intertwined together they're both affected together in, right. in some way and that does invoke some some touching emotions and that just speaks to how right. rj kind of wove all of this into the wheel and the pattern and you and it it, it it makes it kind of epic in a way when he does that yeah, and Charles, I was trying to place this when I was talking before. It's like he gives us the opportunity to get the emotional gut punch of these moments that we never would get to have otherwise. And if this was a typical series where there's no like alternate timelines that are legitimately explored in the text, then we'd never get to feel what it's like for us as the reader to watch Rand and Egwene grow old together and one of them to die. Right. And instead, RJ gives us all of these moments that like are just a fast track to making us feel these things if we're invested in these characters and their relationships. So honestly, RJ couldn't have crafted anything better to just like quickly hit yeah. me over and over again in the feels is like, well, what if it went this way? Wouldn't that hurt you, yeah. Dylan? Yeah. It's like, well, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, what if she died really young? Wouldn't that hurt you, yeah. Dylan? Like, but they could grow old together. Wouldn't that be nice? But eventually they'll die, <laughs> Dylan. Yeah. They will. And I win again, lose Theron. Like, that's uh, RJ. I win again. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> I've won again is the, yeah, I love it. So I think, I mean, that's one my my big theory, Charles, and I was from Night of the World that that Rand will succeed in all the ways that Luz Theron has failed. So this does help drive that home, I think, is kind of living through this over and over again, uh, how Luz Theron has failed right and how might Rand succeed if we after 14 books well said and um we will have to wait and see <laughs> but it's promising um betting that the protagonist is going to succeed is an you know a safe bet but uh, okay it, i mean but i said succeed go on first book that's pretty good yeah yeah well we'll see what happens you know the... we've got 12 more books to go so a lot to 
a lot of theorizing to get to. But before we right. do that, you know, the other thing I want to make sure we talk about is the moments in um, basically Kyrian where, you know, who is to return but Tom Maryland. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't. Were you surprised to see the return of Tom Dylan after we last saw him embracing uh, a fade and kind of a sacrifice moment? No, I a hundred percent was. <laughs> I didn't know if I was to gonna return. like spoil that anything by saying like, "Come on, no one bought that he was con, right?" Like, I didn't want to bring that up last time, but I had a feeling we were both no. like, "Dude, he's obviously not dead." <laughs> So, yeah. no surprise. Didn't but were second. you surprised to realize that a character named Denna is in the mix? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're obviously referencing my uh, my love for a character in Patrick Rothfuss's King Killer Chronicle, also named Denna. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I guess you could say I was surprised <laughs> that there is a character named Denna. I forgot about. I, but you know. Then we love time, right. Dana. When I read it, I was like, oh, Dylan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. I immediately knew you were going to bring it up. I knew, right? I feel uh, this is something I'm forever forever intertwined. Yeah. I'm probably at this point in the fantasy community. Yeah, Dana's your Tavirin. <laughs> right. With, yeah, like Dana and I tied together uh, for better or worse at this point. But yeah, uh, this Dana, unfortunately. I mean, she got the, there's another, like, let's look at it with a current lens, but also be willing to acknowledge it for the time it was in. Like, she got a woman in refrigerator treatment, which is, like, that's a, a trope, is women in refrigerators where basically a female character is introduced and then they are killed just to serve the arc of a male character and that is exactly what, what here, happened here. again we have to be reminded that this is a dated piece in some ways and ahead of its time in others yeah. and i think the denna in this story is unfortunately on the like the end of feeling a bit dated it's like oh here's this younger character who is in love with this way older dude and they're in this weird relationship and now she's dead it's like okay well, glad you were existed to further Tom Maryland's arc. You right. know, like the whole thing read really bizarre to me. Dated. And I was like, hey, like yeah. no one's writing that in 2021. No. <laughs> with that. Yeah. So, interesting. I kind of like, I liked her as a character. Like the idea I of know. the first like female, she's like, I'm going to be the first. And, and then Tom's like, oh, I'll make her a bard or something. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> but uh she doesn't know yeah but uh she'll come around (laughs) yeah no it's weird because it's one of those things that was more surprising now i think than it would have been back then where like now i find most of the authors that we read are very conscious of not doing things like this where they would be like okay i'm not you i just introduced this uh, woman and she's got her own plans and her own potential arc. I can't just kill her suddenly to serve a male character storyline. <laughs> that would be not good. And I guess RJ took me by surprise by <laughs> this being a more dated work where that was a thing that happened all yeah. the time. And I was like, oh, well, like I was not expecting that. So it did hit me hard, I guess, but not not for the best not of the reason rj I, I wanted guess. you to be yeah, that hard right we should have been like exactly no not denna <laughs> we'd have been like oh interesting how fantasy kind of so, wrote itself in a circle here well i was kind of like i was kind of like no not denna because I, I what i'm trying to say charles is like i would if i was reading something that was written this year and i saw a character like denna come in the mix i would be like well you can't like you have to be more conscious like you could but you, i probably wouldn't be reading the book uh if it was a book that hadn't gotten like good enough response where they don't do things like this yeah. I, you no, get, what, I get I'm saying? what you're saying like so i kind of expect you can't just kill that character but this is th- like this is why it's a trope and this is why there's like this stuff happened before in the past and 
RJ yeah, wrote I mean, this at RJ's a different time. Big I get through for his female character was a character that wore britches instead of skirts. <laughs> it was like, okay, well, uh, like, he has like a female Gandalf. Give him that. He credit. has a female, yeah, female Gandalf is a much better. But I think in his mind, the the bigger one was like, look at this. <laughs> but I think he just wrote <laughs> Moraine because that was like an honest portrayal of a real character, and like he was just writing a good character. But for me, he's like, I'm gonna be progressive. I'm gonna put her in pants instead of skirts. And you're like, okay, like. Oh, God. Well, well, she got. She ended up wearing skirts. She did end up having to wear anyway. skirts for a little while there. That was um, kind of the rising action of her arc within this story. <laughs> Come on, but, uh, <laughs> you're you're better than that, Charles. I think that uh, you can uh, you can give RJ a little credit. Or I, I'll say too. Here's here's something. While we're trying to give RJ some credit for these things, I do appreciate. I know this is way ahead of where we're at in the plot or whatever that he has the the ladies go and save Egwene later yeah on. the girls get it done. like that instead of i was ready for Rand to go in with his uh like six foot seven one true power wielding self and uh, and save the damsel in distress but instead we got the ladies yeah, I got together like that and moment i appreciated where Rand, that like in the corner of his eye was like is that Egwene?" and then kind of like had to focus back on what he was doing you know right. like that was kind of a fun um piece to it where it's like no that couldn't be her she's supposed to be in the white tower like she's not gonna be here you know so that was a really interesting um piece of it yeah and then you have um the you have Nynaeve who we know is this kind of like nurturing protective type and she just filled that role so well in in that final scene of of saving Egwene and and this whole thing she had about justice and you know they touched oh yeah a, i grabbed touched a bit on that which i thought was really great too i mean nynaeve always stole the show when when she was on stage for me mm. yeah well charles do you want us to like go a little bit more like through the normal plot progression here we can bounce around at this point i mean i like the few things that i really want to talk about are the ending and all the ending pieces and sure you know i I do have a lot of positive things because like it it might sound like I'm a bit critical on RJ, but that's because I've taken all the good stuff for granted. Like he's the one of the best in the game. And one of the things I did want to compliment him on is the Damani, which I think is so creative and twisted. And it, it, it hits me in a way that not a lot of other like fantasy magic systems or evil creatures do. Like there's something just fundamentally, um, corrupt and like right. gut-wrenching about the fact that something like a Damani even exists that other character like other fantasy characters even in RJ's own world don't live up to it's like oh here's a horrible monster or this is a demon spirit that's the embodiment of evil it's like yeah okay like I can picture those things and they're cool but this is evil like the, the whole idea of like having the leash and the collar and like you're, you're right. trapped and you're being tortured and you're 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 being beaten down like it's so like it's so twisted but in a really creative clever way like you know like i I just gotta give props to to rj's creativity in these moments with the damani it's such a great counter to the i said i you know it's like oh you think you're on top of the world you think you're the most powerful well there's this really simple device that if it gets attached to you uh, you are at the mercy of someone else. And that person is very cruel a lot of times and is trained to treat you like a dog. You know, it's twisted. Yeah. Yeah, it's super messed up. This is really hard for me yeah. to read. And it's, yeah, it's interesting, I guess, coming from someone who reads Joe Abercrombie's work and hardly bats an eye yeah, Exactly, exactly. And then, yeah, in some ways, I guess you expect it with abercrombie and then something super twisted comes in this more high fantasy package with rj where he'll just bring out like oh this awful situation where these uh, like these poor girls and women are being treated like animals and when i mean you couldn't have chosen a 
again, RJ with his, <laughs> I've won again. Yeah. Dylan. <laughs> like, couldn't have chosen a better character to make me feel just absolutely terrible about yeah. the entire situation than Egwene. Very true. And it's totally brutal. I do think, like, it's like, again, one of these, like, she's getting kind of this, like, damsel in distress situation, but I think he saved it with having the lady save her rather than the um rather than having rand march in and yeah, save and her the and was, i do think you know was um female as well which was really interesting and the i said right. i are at the position of being the super powerful ones so i never well that's yeah, where i'm yeah, going okay, go charles but but yeah. finish you finish where it's like i see what you're saying where like it could have easily fallen into the damsel in distress but it didn't and i think that's yes. what increase the payoff of this like Duman, Dumani um, world building piece right. to it is that you it didn't fall into that trope and you weren't thinking about right. that you were more thinking about how dehumanizing is it to be leashed and forced to do things you don't want to do and to give up your identity yeah. and your free will you know and oh yeah for your whole life that's also well said Charles yeah I think that uh, for a lot of reasons RJ balances this extremely well because it's a super delicate thing to try to portray. And the fact that he did it so long ago in a way that like feels super twisted, but doesn't feel like, like you can't, that still delivers. I'll say that still delivers on what he's trying to do in a way that's effective, I think is, is brilliant. It's horribly twisted. It's so hard for me to read and, it's difficult to watch Egwene, you know, she's like got these moments where she reaches for the knife and her hand just starts like twisting and contorting right, right. and she can't even do it. And I don't know, you know, we were talking about how Jake brought up this embrace the yeah. scary. That's you could a make moment. The, it's almost you out make of the wheel of time show. That's just like so depressing and gory and terrifying but telling the exact same story just changing the lens where it's like you don't want to i don't yeah. want to but you don't want to embrace all the scary <laughs> let's uh keep it high fantasy and well, you know because you could really get bummed out with with stuff like this you know it's just having seen things like the ring and stuff like that i was imagining that sort of like you know, like horror movie, like twisting of the hand. Oh, yeah, you yeah, know what yeah, I'm saying? yeah, the supernatural like, kind of something fundamentally yeah, like wrong cont- about the effect of right. wanting to harm yourself. Yeah, is messed up. And then even like these so, little details of like, oh, other Dilmani like ratting out people trying to save them or stopping people from yeah. trying to save them because they've been so beaten down and conditioned to be subservient. You know, things are just fundamentally wrong that are so bought in in these moments. You're like, man, this is a really, like I've never felt like a character was in more danger just because I think in fantasy you have that problem sometimes where it's like, oh, what, you don't think your main character is in danger right now? Like he's obviously going to survive. But in these moments, like how long is she going to be like this? Yeah. This is really, really bad. And you really believe that she's um, in trouble and you don't know what's going to happen to her. You know, it could be anything. And that's just one of the really great moments of this book it's horrible but great (laughs) yeah hurts me in the heart i think i would have probably needed my my bucket for (laughs) my tears for this one and i think that yeah it's so painful to watch Egwene deal with it it goes on long and somehow it worsened almost by these moments where things aren't like she can just kind of have a conversation yeah. with Min and <laughs> just describe how terrible her yeah. life is. And then it immediately goes back to being that terrible. Is so that somehow like makes it feel Yeah, there's so many tropes where it's like, oh, she's finally reunited and, with Min. She, she can be rescued. But it's like, you're allowed to meet right. Min whenever you want because guess what? There's nothing she can do. And that's right. a layer of it, you know? It's like this oppressive it, nature of it. Well, yeah, it makes it renders her even more powerless. And you touched on something great there, Charles, which is this Aes Sedai being the really powerful folks in this world, but they can be rendered so horribly powerless mm-hmm. by these situations. And to watch a Gwen kind of be starting to come into her own with her power and then have it all taken from her and be 
left powerless like this is really hard to watch. And, you know, I was mentioning in our Eye of the World episode that what I think is really interesting about where I thought Egwene's arc is going, and I still think Egwene's arc is going, is she started as someone who has this desire to, like, a very, I think, like, good intention, desire to, like, implement her power in the world but she didn't have any at all in the eye of the world and she would still try like she'd try to fight the forsaken when she couldn't do really anything about it and uh, she was plucky and intrepid but she just didn't have the ability to do something about it and just as she's starting in book (laughs) two of 14 to get to this place of like oh like Egwene you can do some things like go for you good for you like again it's stripped from her and she it's just super hard and i think that what i do like about where i hope this is building uh and steven said i would like the arc so i'm going to say i'm probably on the right track then uh because i think it's not just gonna be her getting rendered powerless oh, over and over it. and over again <laughs> i don't think i'd like that arc um but i do think this is just another moment that is going to make the payoff when Egwene does become more powerful and able to actually do the things that she wants to be able to do with all that courage uh, that she has, I think it's going to make that awesome. And I am looking forward to, I don't know how many books of this yeah. we're going to have to deal with I before mean, we get yeah, there. It's Charles, interesting that you, I do you go get back there. to eye of the world and she's willing to even being virtually defenseless, take on these great things. And then that really gets tested right. through the Damani. And how great was the reveal that the Suldam, the oppressors, are channelers themselves mm. and could just as easily yes. be on the other end of the leash. But it's just this yeah. propaganda that keeps them as the leash holders. Like That's just such another right. brilliant level to it where it's like even this superiority complex is totally fabricated because they're the same. And it doesn't matter. It just comes down to having power over somebody else. And that is just so... Like that to me was the best twist in this whole book. I was like, oh, now that is a twist. <laughs> you know, where it's like the, the they hate Aes Sedai and they leash them and treat them like dogs, but they don't realize that they have the same abilities. And it's only when that they put the leash on them, set the collar on themselves, that they got like super terrified and were like shaking and went from having total confidence and control to being like, please, anything but this, you know? It's just, it was such another really interesting layer to the Damani. Like, if you didn't have enough reasons to not like them, that kind of took the, that was kind of the cherry on top. For sure. I think you make, like, you make such awesome points there, Charles. It's really poetic. Yeah. And I think that this, this idea is exemplified really well too in the way that Nynaeve treats the aftermath of this like in some ways she tries to give them this kind of poetic justice moment of it and we also have Egwene who like this is parf yes like I like I like how I guess one things I like about Egwene is among a bunch of not super proactive characters sometimes (laughs) like Rand we get Egwene who's just super proactive when she can be and she's freed and she's immediately like, I'm going to choke this person. At, like, I'm going to end this right, person. She takes, the, and, she takes the leash. Yeah. And she's she's basically trying to kill yes. the person is what Egwene might have done. And, you know, it's hard not to – it's hard to think that you wouldn't want the same thing if you were in her shoes. And then Nynaeve says to Egwene, is all right to hate them, Egwene. It is. They deserve it. But it isn't all right to let them make you like they are. Yes. And it goes to show that this difference between uh, the two factions is more of a perspective thing and what they were trained and who, what they were turned into than it is anything actually based in reality which so reflects I, I, real yeah. life so honestly you know right like how many times have we seen this in history you know where it's like when you try and justify things like war and you know one nation being better than another you know you can you can make those parallels here and it's super interesting and the justice that Nynaeve places on them which is to 
leave them to their own people, you know, let them find out for right. themselves and whatever happens, happens. She's like, that was kind of cruel, but, uh, you know, it's the closest thing to justice we're going to get fr- from all this. And I thought that was really uh, kind of, you know, poetic as well. And it's a theme we see explored a lot in like World War Two movies and things like that. You know, it's like these really, for really sure. honest moments about just like oppressive peoples and society you know it's really interesting and yeah i mean there's other stuff that goes on in this book something about you know a great hunt or whatever but these moments <laughs> really shown <laughs> the horn they, was lost and they, found and lost they and lose, found. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime while all this other stuff was happening like we had the <laughs> the test of the accepted and we had the damani but yeah there was also at the same time the plot of this of this I guess it was a hunt, you know, in this book called The Great Hunt. <laughs> yes. Uh, which, I mean, yeah. I guess that leaves us, you know, with the ending. Lots of stuff happens. Um, was there anything in particular you wanted to make sure we touched on in these final moments? Well, I do like Matt blowing the horn. Yeah, that I was guess a nice development. Because, yeah, it's another thing. I've been told over and over again by you, Charles, and by folks on on Twitter, too, who are getting a sense for my <laughs> taste of characters and what I like, that I will go on to like Matt. <laughs> and I think that I finally got my first moment by the end of the second book where I was like, oh, like, Good on you, Matt. Like <laughs> he was the and, only one. That I was asking this question, like, can right. someone blow the horn, please? Like, even Pat on Thane, I was like, blow the horn, blow the horn, like somebody. And he's just like, one day I will be patient, and then I will have the dagger back, and maybe the horn too. You're like, okay, but finally, I was <laughs> like a worm. <laughs> so I was like, thank you, Matt. Thank you, <laughs> somebody. <laughs> That's the moment when he's doing the worm thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, good on Matt, I think. And I guess I I thought after all this that Rand would blow the horn. So if you want right. to uh, I think, think everyone I was wrong in the book about... was expecting that as well. Um, yeah. A lot of the, like, main characters that knew what was going on was like, he will bring the coming of the whatever. And he's like, okay, well, Rand's going to blow the horn. And Rand was kind of pushing back on it. He's like, I'm a shepherd from the two rivers, <laughs> but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Matt was like, uh, you know, it's like a burn all of you. <laughs> I was like, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good on Matt. I appreciate, I always appreciate that proactivity. And, and I think that's something that what, hopefully Matt's able to, I, I don't know what's going to happen with all this dagger stuff, but once all this is under control, hopefully then he can start, like showing us his true nature and we can start enjoying more moments like this right. where Rand is, you know, sitting there being all, I'm a shepherd from the two rivers. <laughs> and Matt is like, I'm just going to blow this thing. <laughs> it's like, someone's got to do something. I like it. Like Matt yeah. oftentimes operates from the position of just being frustrated. <laughs> where I feel it's like that kind of, he kind of wins over the people in that way a little bit. So, yeah, that was a great <laughs> moment. It's just a little spice to the world building, you know. It's like you have other characters that do significant things. Like, it's not just Ran doing all the fancy stuff, you know. You get someone like Matt who gets to be the one that blew the horn, you know. So, it's fun. And uh, I, I was all in on that. I thought that was great. Um, yeah. I The the battle at the end with Alzaman, you know, that was a little bit of blow by blow action from from um RJ. He goes through RJ. the names of all but he tells it through like these poetic names of sword moves yeah. like Eagle prancing on the field. <laughs> you know, like, you know, the, the tree sprouts yeah. from the ground into the the jumping tiger. You know, you're like, okay, like that sounds cool. I can kind of picture what that is. Um fancy sword moves, at least. Um and then you had the the sheath the sword moment um, with his fight with Balzaman too. 
which fulfilled right. some kind of prophecy of being marked by the heron twice. And then the battle got projected into the sky and everyone saw it. You know, that was an interesting piece. So now kind of like a word is out. Rand is the dragon reborn. So it's an interesting predicament we're in. What's your takeaway with um, with the whole ending and I guess with the great hunt? All right, well. We'll start with the the ending, I guess. I think that I, I, I mean it's kind of it's feeling it's mirroring the way that the wheel <laughs> weaves and the pattern in the sense that both books have kind of ended with this like battle with Bialzaman stick, right. and Rand thinks that he's defeated Bialzaman, and I'm assuming that you know we got <laughs> a lot more reading to do that maybe he hasn't. Um, so that part, yeah, we do get this kind of, I think it's an interesting scene. Like I definitely enjoyed it and I did feel like, okay, yeah, like we've, we've hit this beat before the beat that I'm interested in Mm -hmm. Charles at the end is that Rand is finally accepting that he is the dragon reborn and that's where we needed to get to. So I'm okay. I'm wondering if he really is accepting still at this point i like he sees the brand and he's like no no <laughs> you know like I th- maybe he's kind of lamenting it i i am not quite sure but yeah it, it is like there's, it's hard to deny it you know but rand as we know doesn't like to see things that everyone else in the well books can see i feel like I don't have it in front of me, but I feel like it's kind of like Moraine gives him this, like, dude, it is, like, yeah, I don't want, like, <laughs> like, it's time. It's time to either say you're in on this thing or you're He does out. proclaim himself and to be the dragon reborn. You are right. Right. Yeah, he does. Okay, cool. So, I, yeah, he gets, a, I'm sure it's Rand. So, I'm sure we will get lots of more internal monologue about his reluctance and at the same time we got this moment where moraine said put up or shut up and rand said i'm gonna put up like let's do it and that's the i'm glad it ends on that sort of note i know we get a little bit more like an epilogue sort of thing but and the epilogue is kind of just like Everyone started, even more people started seeing how amazing (laughs) Rand was. Exactly. (laughs) But now Rand's finally starting to see it for himself. So let's hope that he'll be, he'll be moving forward from here. So Rand proclaims to be the dragon reborn. Um, Matt binds himself to yet another physical object. (laughs) Like, (laughs) <laughs> as as yes. one does he doesn't care he's like whatever like what i'm bound to this for life okay like what let's just add it to the pile of things right. like i've got a dagger i've got a horn <laughs> that's kind of you know that's kind of how i play D D. charles is just the like, reckless like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. just reckless this will affect yeah, me for life. Cool. like chaotic <laughs> chaotic neutral chaotic good on a good day uh, and just yeah sure i'll do it whatever because usually like a character has like in fantasy has like the one hook to them where it's like oh that's bound to you for life a- and matt's just kind of like <laughs> making those commitments to multiple Fine. things he's like okay okay right. okay so it's kind of funny to picture a character that has like all of these mythical yeah. objects bound to him forever and you're just and he's just like this kind of silly guy so yeah it's just funny that matt's well, the one who blew the horn in that moment it's like Yep, there we go. And Perrin is still doing Perrin stuff, you know. He's the same. Perrin is doing Perrin stuff. Have we said Perrin's name yet on this? I recording? maybe we talked definitely talked about him before, but yeah, did he's like <laughs> he's the pseudo sniffer for a while. That's kind of what he's done at that, this point. Yeah. Um and uh yeah, that's the trio. Um so interesting to see how that continues. But yeah, man, I, I took away from this, you know, there's some pieces that I really, really enjoyed. And it reminds me of a lot of the great things of Wheel of Time. This idea of, again, like 
you know, destiny versus free will, the whole creativity behind the I said I, I've always found super interesting, you know, that we are introduced to the Black Aja, which is super interesting, you know, like the, the world gets even bigger with this whole, like, this whole other race of people with the Damani and everything. So, um, yeah, just, uh, you know, looking forward to seeing this world continue to break open and, and, and see more of, you know, departing more from Lord of the Rings and more into RJ's kind of mm-hmm. writing style. So Yeah. Yeah, no, I thought it was great. Yeah. Looking forward no, to Dragon the, Reborn. Right, yeah. The, the big picture takeaways for me, I'd say, ab- about this sort of, it's fit in the fantasy genre the and all kind of stuff. Own 14 book thing. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, I'll say that I learned a lot here of how it might have influenced the King Killer Chronicle. Interesting. Outside of yeah, outside of maybe just a character named Denna. <laughs> I have no idea if that had in, any influence. If Roth this was like I'm going to do this Denna character right <laughs> because you know both characters are pretty musical in their own ways and stuff so i don't that's know true. um yeah i don't know <laughs> about that i'm just that's but that aside that whole bit with the great game oh yeah would the game felt of like thrown I mean, to be <laughs> right but actually it seems like it had a much bigger influence on the way that Rothfuss yes. wrote with that invitations part of the wise and things like that, and with, yeah, whether you accept invitations or not, and you know, not being able to stay neutral about it. You know, yeah, I see that completely. Yeah, so I felt like actually I was like, oh wow, like I'm coming to this after reading the King Killer Chronicles. Yeah, RJ so brought a like, lot to the table that authors today did. are still exploring and putting their own voice in. You know, there's so many different pieces yeah. that different authors kind of were drawn to and have like explored in their own voice. And it's super interesting to see these moments and be like, oh, yeah, you know, I kind of see how the this is like the breaking off point in the pattern. Right. <laughs> Where you have, you know, this these books came out and all of a sudden all these other authors were kind of, you know pulling pieces of it and it's super interesting to see where everyone's influences kind of lie that's a really great point about king killer chronicles actually i didn't consider that but it's totally valid oh yeah it was the first thing i thought of i mean it's when i was seeing the great game stuff and the letters were coming and all this thing it felt like Rothfuss really took his time with the you know, Rothfuss. No surprise there. <laughs> no su- Rothfuss really <laughs> took his time. You can stop your sentence right there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Well, but I, I love the wise man's sphere and the way that they explore these things in a little bit more depth. It feels like, uh, though, it had to have been influenced by, by this moment to some extent, or it was a total coincidence. Yeah, so I mean, that's just one moment. You start to see the ways in which both Wheel of Time has clearly impacted some of these more modern authors, like I was just mentioning, but also these ways in which it sticks out. And I guess I wasn't expecting to see as much in the way of sticking Mm. out when it came to Wheel of Time. I was ready for like seeing this from almost a like fantasy historian's Mm -hmm. perspective. Where does this fit in? And it certainly does. But it also has these moments like that you know, we talked about uh, the trial of the accepted and uh, the, or the test of the accepted, I guess it's not a trial. And then those moments of the possible life timelines that Rand could have followed. Mm. And it was almost like that remind me of, I, I forgot to say it. That remind me of Mr. Nobody. If you've seen that movie or if anyone listeners, you check recommended out that to me, but I never got around to watching it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you're like me and you really liked these like alternate timeline lives that Rand could have followed, then check out Mr. Nobody. And the fact that I'm jumping to some movie, I think it's, it, it was on Netflix last time I checked, but it might not, not be anymore. Mm. Uh, but it, the fact that that's the first thing I think of is like some deep cut movie with Jared Leto <laughs> rather than some other fantasy novel is telling as to how unique this some of these storytelling devices are that 
Jordan is implementing. And it's super exciting to be getting something so fresh right. as someone who's read a lot of work influenced by Wheel of Time, yep. and but not Wheel of it's Time yet. It's true. Like, it's there's a lot of really ingenious creativity going on in here that um, definitely keeps like rj at the top of the of at the, of the you know influencers in fantasy and it, on the mount yeah rushmore. on the mount rushmore for of sure the well fantasy said. mount yeah, rushmore he's, he's that... a face on the fantasy mount rushmore big time <laughs> uh so right. um yeah that is it guys I, I i think we're good i'm good if you are dylan with um the great hunt yeah, I'm feeling good. I'm, you know, we've got a lot more real time to talk. Very and true. You know, that's we'll two down, ten, uh, twelve more right. to go. <laughs> uh, yes. So we're gonna be reading the Dragon Reborn as our next buddy read before taking a short little hiatus before getting into books four through six. But um, you know, if we've got everything we needed to say for the Great Hunt, I think we're ready for that sweet, sweet outro music. Oh, I didn't talk about Loyal. Is there something you really wanted to say about Loyal? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say that I don't have anything to say about Loyal. Well, you've said it. <laughs> and to hit me up on social media if you Rant. if you want more. Studying Shentai. <laughs> oh, that's what I'll say. We got like three hasty drops <laughs> at least in this so one. Like, hasty, I think. Man. Yeah, Loyal is yet to <laughs> yeah yet to grow on me. Oh so. uh, well, you know, he's a. Uh, but you know what's go for it. You you say what you got to say. <laughs> what is growing on me? What Charles? is growing on you, Dylan? The Wheel of Time series oh. and enjoying it with my wonderful buddy, my lifelong friend. You, Charles, and of course, all the wonderful listeners out there who've been interacting with us. Uh, I so keep on doing that. We're having could a great not time. Have said it any better myself, Dylan. This is, has been a pleasure as always. Fans, thank you for listening. And if you're ready for us to plug some of our stuff, I think we can go right into that sweet, sweet outro. Right. Thank you, everybody, for listening to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. If you like what you heard today, reach out to us on Twitter. You know, you can bug Dylan about Loyal and Denna1 or Denna2, you know, King Killer Denna, uh, Great Hunt Denna. Great. You know, go ahead and reach out to him. Let him know. That's over on Twitter at the FTF Podcast with the number one at the end. You can also reach out on Facebook and Instagram at the FTF Podcast. You can always send an email at the FTF Podcast at gmail.com. And Dylan, if they love us, want to support us, happy to be listening on Apple Podcasts, what can they do? Toss five stars Toss to our podcast. Stars. Just click on that Friends Talking Fantasy podcast page on your Apple Podcast app. Scroll down until you start seeing stars. Then ideally you would click five yes. of those if you wanted to support yes. the show. If you had a little bit of extra time and wanted to write a review, that helps us even more. But just listening just is more than enough Thank you so much. We really Thank you so much for listening, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Greatly appreciate it. And as always, go forth and conquer, friends.